Hi there, folks, and welcome to NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima again. Thanks for joining us today. Great to have you with us. Autumn is upon us here in Japan. Nice, cool evenings, and even the day is not nearly as hot and humid as it was just two or three weeks ago, which is great. Hope all of you are feeling as refreshed as we are here in Fukuoka. On the COVID front, resident foreigners are now finally allowed to come back into the country. The fact that we were、uh, treated differently from native Japanese residents is still a very sore spot for many of us here, as well, for, as well as for quite a few international corporations who've suddenly realized that when things go south in Japan, the country very quickly becomes just as insular, not to say racist, as it has been for many centuries. And these corporations, along with quite a few resident foreigners, are now having a long think about whether they really want to call Japan home on both the personal and financial fronts. What else? We've lost our long reigning Prime Minister, Shinzo Abe, to、um, health issues, apparently, and his replacement, Yoshihide Suga, who used to be Abe's chief cabinet minister, has just won the party's vote by a landslide, actually, over 70%.、Mm-hmm. And he will be sworn in tomorrow.、Uh, I wish I could say he brings anything new to the table, but unfortunately, that does not seem to be the case. He's really seen as Abe's former, former right hand man, and he tends to toe the party line and refrain from making any controversial decisions or statements. His main support body is、um, non existent, really. It's generally agreed that the main reasons he won are due to the fact that the other powerful factions in the Liberal Democratic Party,、uh, which is a misleading name, by the way, since they're actually the conservative mainstream right wing party here in Japan. So, anyway, his sudden spring to the top is generally considered to be based on the fact that the other powerful factions in the party prefer to have someone in the top position who can be more easily influenced and persuaded to do their bidding rather than have to deal with the chance of an opposing factor、uh, taking the lead and then having to clash with an opponent. So, I hope I'm proven wrong here, but it does look like、um, probably not much will change. On the policies that matter the most for Japan, at least in my opinion, and that of many others. So, mainly improving work conditions, workforce participation, and childcare support for Japanese women, as well as、uh, immigration policies.、Uh, but again, I could be proven wrong. Definitely hope that that will be the case. So, yes, foreigners are slowly being allowed back into the country, starting with resident foreigners, but hopefully that could mean that barring any significant resurgence of COVID infections, We may see the tourists come back as well over the next few months or at least early next year at the latest, which means rekindled interest in hospitality properties, hotels, resorts, yokan, onsen type properties, you know, those charming little countryside inns and natural hot spring resorts that Japan is so famous for. And we've recently had quite a few inquiries from both existing and new clients who are looking into buying some of these properties. Particularly now that so many of them are very close to、um, or already are going out of business due to the complete lack of international tourism and also the sharp drop in domestic tourism that the pandemic brought about. So, today's conversation is with a US couple who are now looking into potentially getting one of these countryside properties and turning it into a holiday property somewhere down the track. So, they've emailed us with a very clear idea of the type of place they'd be interested in. High up on the mountain,、uh, with or in close proximity at least to an onsen, a natural hot spring, near a farming community. And they've even mentioned that they want to be close to a temple if possible. Now, finding a property that'll satisfy all of this criteria is probably not the most difficult part of this sort of business plan. There are plenty of those for sale in the Japanese countryside and quite affordable as well once you get away from the major cities a bit. But the main challenge here is running and managing this kind of business, particularly when one is still living overseas. And that's really what we spoke about mainly. So, potential management solutions,、uh, the different laws and bylaws on the national and prefectural level that specify if and how this sort of operation can be run, and what exactly would be the best way to explore and then implement this kind of business plan. So here's a chat with them. I hope you find value in it, and I shall see you again on the other side. Oh, and the first couple of minutes are a bit fuzzy on their end, so you'll probably be hearing me talking mainly, but that does improve after five or so minutes in. So bear with us. Here goes. Right, go for it. So I was reading your email. You've got your、uh, location and the、uh, property profile down pat, so that makes it easier for us.、Um, well, location as a tip. 
Yep. So uh, that way, more than likely to have hot springs in the area. So that's kind of our main goal. Yeah. Well, the um the actual property search and purchase, I think, um, is probably the easier part. But I just wanted to um get a bit of a better idea of um, what your business plan was as far as um, are you going to be living here and running the place? Are you going to be hiring staff? Are you What exactly were you planning to do with it? Well, we would probably be hiring staff, but may not start operating it immediately after purchasing it. We've got a, some other business activity going on in another country and our attention is devoted to that right now, but we're looking at potentially acquiring the asset and then depending on how the markets are changing over the next year or so, then that's going to kind of dictate when we begin. Um, and as far as size of operation, that's kind of, we're not really sure yet what we want to take on size wise. So that's probably the only unknown variable at the moment. So we're, we're really kind of looking more at it from an opportunity standpoint right now. Yep. So just so we're to... open-minded about scale. Yeah, the thing is, in those particular areas that you're looking at, um, there's not going to be management companies that can take on this place on a as-needed basis sort of thing. So you yeah. will need to have staff who's living there or in the area who's able to do that for you. And I'm guessing because you're catering to specifically foreign tourists, if I understand correctly? Probably, not, yeah. Not Japanese? So you oh. need... Buy or trilingual yeah. staff or something, yeah? Give it away. That's well, I don't know. I mean, I the economies are different depending on how you operate. Um, but I mean, to your point regarding the labor question, yeah. uh, that's something that we discussed and we're kind of counting on that in some cases. We're actually looking, uh, we're mostly interested in a more of a rural, remote type of scenario, so um, we haven't solved the staff question, uh, but we have some ideas of how we might do that. Now, uh, but that's one of those things where, you know, that's just how I think it out. more than likely we would need at least one or, or two persons to, to start well, with I, our staff. Yeah, and I think that, I think it would be fair that Ideally, although it's a situation that we could create if necessary, but ideally we might want to consider uh, facilities that have quarters for staff to live in. Yeah. If it's if it tends to be a remote location, but what what we're really looking to achieve is um, is a remote type resort situation, not not really a, a high energy. Um, vacation, but more of a vacation uh, geared towards isolation. Right, so far... But not, necessarily, but not necessarily separate from local culture or anything, if there's any, but really just kind of a, a remote experience. Okay. Um, okay. And you mentioned a few uh, things that I can see you're already aware of some of the uh, Minpaku legislation and so forth. So let me just run a few other things by you that you haven't mentioned. So the 180 days a year uh, limit um, and the need to have a staffer on hand or at least within a certain distance from the property and also all of the uh, compliance with um, hygiene requirements, fire safety, regular cleaning, that sort of thing, that's probably something that, I mean, it changes from prefecture to prefecture. So we'll need to query that particular area that you find your property in and see maybe pre-purchase, because there are also some rules about um, how far it can be from uh, schools and kindergartens and public facilities like nursing homes or libraries and so forth. So we just need to make sure that before we actually pull the trigger, it satisfies all of that. And then you'll need to bring an architecture company in to have a look at the layout and the facilities and tell you what needs to be done to bring it up to speed with regulations locally. Right. As a requirement, right? As a requirement for the um, for the uh, Minpaku license. And I'm guessing, I mean, the 180 days rule uh, is more geared toward 
owners operators so they're sort of assuming that some one of one of the owners or at least um somebody who's registered as the operator is living on site or very close to on site um if you're going to be staffing it and you're going to be hopefully just to release you from that 180 days limit it might be a good idea to apply for a in license or a, what they call a hotel license and um, they're a few categories um, in that legislation, but it's not very expensive or um, there's not too many hoops to jump through and it will release you from that limit. Okay. Um, so, oh. yeah, half, half the year, basically. They only let you do, yeah. uh, let you do it half the year. Well, um, let, me, let me ask you this question. Um, is it possible, does the place have to be dormant? Uh, outside of that period of time, or can somebody be living there full time for the off days, I guess? Oh, li not... living is never a problem, yeah. Well, when you say somebody living there, it can be either um, somebody who's not paying to stay, or it can be somebody on an actual tenancy lease. Right, like a six month lease or something. Yeah, so right. that that's not an issue, that's fine. It's only the... Um, the short term stay, no lease, kind of Airbnb type, that's limited to 180 days. Oh, and that's okay. Or you can only rent it out 180 days. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I understand what you're oh. getting at. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Without a lease. If it's so with it's a just, lease, it's, it's, so it's just. I'm sorry, go ahead. If it's with a lease, it doesn't fall under um, the MinPACU legislation, the short term stay legislation. It's just normal leasing, in which case there's no limit. Different legal agreement. We, if we have that in end license, in yeah, and you can not operate throughout the year. That's not a problem. Okay. Yeah. And, so and it's just probably just basic license registration. Right. Inexpensive, just okay. paperwork, time, no sweat. Good. Okay. But again, that will depend on the area. So I think the best okay. way to approach it. Might end up. Sorry. No, no, go um, for it. I think we we are open to areas that you think it will be. Or, um, well, we're exploring right better, now, so, what you know, kind of arrangement? Right. So. Um, well, we can maybe benchmark a few prefectures and then check on each of their particular uh, compliance requirements as far as Minpaku go, as far as short-term stay goes. And then maybe find the area that's most lenient and then try to look at um, particular locations there that might be attractive and just go down the list from there, maybe. Um, that might be the best way to do it chronologically. Also, not all of these places will have um, places available for purchase throughout the year that might suit you. But you're saying that you're taking your time with this, so we, we, we're not we're not really um, stressed to close on a deal within the next three or six months or anything like that, right? Well, it depends. If it's a good opportunity for an asset, that's one thing. Uh, as far as committing to operate, starting a business up and operating there immediately after that's the part that we're not yeah, we're going not to commit ready. to and so we're ready to do that like i said we've got some other projects going on right now yeah but i mean with the purchase you're not um, in any rush to get it done as soon as possible you're ha you're happy to quest yeah. and sort of look for good opportunities right yeah. sure yeah because there, there's I not mean, a huge amount of properties for sale in those um remote areas so it will take some searching and uh, fine-tuning and so forth you know and another thing too and I know you, you've been talking about the short-term rental and can you do that um, and, and the limitations. I mean, if, if it's an area where it's not allowed but we can still get a hotelier, a hotel license, that's fine too. So, you know. um, well, the only thing with the hotel licenses is, is that it requires you to set up a local corporate structure. Gotcha. And that, okay. that comes with... Um, something like 3000 bucks to set up but then the main thing is that it'll cost you about 2000 bucks or 2500 bucks a year in uh, bookkeeping and accounting and be, and, and so okay. forth for upkeep so i'm not sure do you have Depends a rough idea of, yeah exactly do you know how many rooms you were looking at that's we're pretty open to it yeah we're really open uh, actually we don't necessarily we're not necessarily looking for a, a full on travelers hotel right of conventional sorts, um, you know. In fact, actually, we, more like a an old farm that we that this interesting house that we can yeah. convert into a place where we can rent up. And I have a few lists, but I haven't sent it to you. 
for you to take a look. Um, it's more like an old house that they abandoned, but a lot of these houses do not have onsen or not even near onsen, so I don't know. I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> well, so Hard. we're kicking around different business ideas, but um, I think it's going to end up being a short-term rental type scenario, so I well, think we should just count on it. 180. Yeah. I'm sorry. Thinking out loud. No, no, no. But that's yeah, fine. I, focus on the prefectures, or I guess where this would be probably more understood and common, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Whatever makes sense. You know the market there, we don't. <laughs> um, well, with the remote properties, I mean, we've helped some customers purchase homes for their own use, and we've helped people look into what you're looking into as well. Um, I can't tell you that any of them have gone for it just because, um, well, for one thing, the local prefectural government can be more open in some cases, but that's usually in the areas that are more expensive and more internationally renowned, like some of the uh, more uh, pricey ski resort towns and so forth. The ones that are like the ones that you're, I think you're thinking of, like the dreamy little home away from home in the Japanese countryside, they're not really that open to those ideas just yet. Uh -huh. It's just for us to use, right? More, more of this. Well, no, just in the general. Use, use. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, again, we've had people look into it and we had quite a few people who were just about to pull the trigger before COVID hit and then they sort of backed off. Um. But, I mean, we're always happy to do the research. We've got, um, I think, Nagano, Nagano or Niigata Prefecture, we've already got some specifications from local uh, city halls. So we know I really what, like Nagano. Yeah. yeah. So I'll send you what we've got there. And the rest of them we'll have to look into and contact the local tourism bureau, and they'll then refer us to the um, appropriate government authority to speak to in their, um, in their particular areas, and then we'll be able to get more info on other prefectures as well. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, frankly, I'm not quite sure uh, what we want in Japan and where. She's got a better idea than I do because she spends more time researching that stuff. Okay. Getting it. Um, I'm more business and process. So, so size, um, size and layout wise, um, are we talking about three, five, ten rooms? What, were you, what did you have in mind? Five? Um, Four to six would probably be. No, their room is their county. Yeah, that's right. right. There's a term for that. Yeah, or, um, so, um, what, what do you think? Guest rooms, I mean. Right, right. Are you talking about the bedrooms? The you? size of the rooms or the number or of rooms? No, no, the number, the number of the rooms. Oh, that's hard to... I'd say know. four to six rooms that we could use for guests if, if we came to it, right? Okay, I'm, I'm just... Probably reason I'm asking is I'm just trying to figure out if you want to set up a company. I don't think if you're going under nine or ten rooms, it'll be worth it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It might no, be more I, I, I like to have a house that's not too big, that can be rent for just one family, actually. It would be nice. And, and to your point about labor in remote areas, it may be slim pickings, right, to get help. So you yeah. probably don't want a facility that's very large either, yeah. so that we're always constantly dealing with staffing turnover. You know, yeah. Better if we can find a couple of people that might want to live on site, work there, you know, because they like and, being. And have a there. guest house. It'll be nice too. Yeah. That way we can stay there too if we want to. Right. So kind of what I'm expecting is that if we do this and we start the business, we have to take our time starting it getting it going because it's probably going to take time to find the right people and get the whole thing operating correctly and everything. So we probably would end up living there for a period of time as we're getting things set up. Okay. Will you be doing the, um, are you DIY types? You're going to be doing the renovations and the um, repairs and everything that's needed yourselves or are you going to be hiring? Not necessarily, not necessarily but would probably be there uh, okay. to manage it. Yeah. Right. So it's kind of like. Uh, things that we can do ourselves though, isn't it? No. <laughs> Why no, would I? I'm, yeah, I'm just doing my very best to do that less. Because I've only got so much time during the day. I, I, I'm, I'm with you time. there, Paul. If there's so somebody else, else, somebody else does it much that. better, right? I, I like it when it's free, so but, I want him to do it. Well, you know, part of this is that we are, you know, there, there is a rise in tourism in Japan, and we're familiar, we've been there, and, and you know, we just think that 
it would be good, good to have get something operating there um, and see where it goes. You and know, just bear in mind about, that um, if you guys are not doing the work yourselves, if there's going to be a local company doing it, there. do you guys speak Japanese? No. Yeah. No. Um, so managing, <laughs> managing them in person is not going to be an option, I'm afraid. Yeah, well, that's, that's the other part. There are a lot of challenges. At least challenges we have to hire around. someone to do it. That's all. why we're not committing to starting right away after we acquire a property. So yeah. we, well, time. in the long run, we don't even mind if it's just for us to use. It probably no. will be for the it's first for couple our years. Yeah. We also have some stuff going on in Bali right now as well. So yeah. we'll probably be, once we go we there and start to building. We back and forth between Bali and Japan. We were thinking we could do that. And then I can figure out how to start a business in Japan. Right. <laughs> so we just have that. a place to stay until We then. just love Japan too but, much. <laughs> but we want to, we want it to, we want to convert it to, uh, you know, a full-on tourist hotel, basically. Yeah. So we want we want to buy a we want to buy a house that you're going to like and enjoy, but it's gotta also comply with them potentially turning into a tourist accommodation down the track, right? Uh, even, exactly. even if it is a tourist type building that's already kind of set up there, we just stay there, right? As yeah, permanent tourists. But the point is, is that that's that's the direction we want to take it because we're probably not going to live there full time. Okay. Yeah. You, you just you know start right from the beginning with that assumption that we're going to operate it as a business. Right. And you know. Whenever that happens, yeah. Preferably make it operate in the black, and if so, we keep it. Okay. Right. So again, I'm just just to confirm the game plan. So the chronological order should be to first look into different prefectures, um, see how lenient or unlenient they are as far as potential tourist accommodation goes and yeah. then start looking at potential properties that satisfy their requirements. Is that about right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to rub anybody the wrong way. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, even if the government says it's okay, you might have neighbors that don't like the idea. So that, that'll be up to you to be uh, political there. I've read about that. And that's, that's what okay. I think. Yeah, and that's kind of, you know, we're concerned about that. We don't want to be forcing anything on the people. So, yeah. you know. So it, I guess ideally we would want to be in an area where we would be expected, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so okay. you said that some of these areas I mentioned, it's more for uh, care for people who actually live to live in, not to rent out. Is that what you said? Well, the national legislation that came into effect uh, almost three years ago now, I think, um, that changed the um, because Airbnb was becoming a big thing in Japan, and um, it was a sort of a mix between the uh, hotel lobby freaking out about losing business, and also a lot of um, traditional Japanese um, neighbors and people who live in condo units, and they just didn't like to see that many foreigners coming in and out and carrying rubbish at the wrong hours in the wrong bags, that sort of thing. And um, so they put in legislation that's meant to say. The basic idea was, okay, if you're living in the place uh, or very close to the place and you want to run it as a sort of a side business and rent rooms out to people that are staying in the house with you, that's fine. You can do it for half the year. Um, but to run an actual accommodation business, please apply for a proper license. That was the basic mindset behind the legislation. Um, but a lot of people, again, a lot of people are still doing it within the um, sort of side business limits. Most of them, I think, are living on the property because, again, if the property is too small and it's not generating enough business, mm -hmm. staffing just um, staffing and compliance with cleaning and all of that just might not make sense financially. Um, so that's why I was asking about the size of the place um, and whether you're going to be there or not. It has to be. It has to be. Mm. And then the other thing they did is they gave local municipalities um, the power to further fine-tune those legislations in their particular areas. Um, and I, I want to say some of them, but I'm, I, probably most of them have made it a bit stricter because they're not that happy with rampant tourism, they call it, which is kind of silly, but it's the way they think here in many cases. Um, so some of them make it easier, some of them are just going by the national legislation, some of them are making it harder. So we have to look it's into each other. Yeah. You also got to check. Yeah. 
So we have to look into that. And as I was telling Evita, I mean, we are happy to do that kind of research for you. Um, but for that sort of work, we have to charge by the hour. And then once you start, once you pick an area and we start looking at particular properties in that area, then that's part of the fixed price for the property sale facilitation that we can do. But all the surrounding research, um, that's going to be usually, that's going to be a lot beyond what we do for a normal property settlement. So that we have to charge by the hour. Yeah. So, so you're talking about um, investigating the requirements, the paperwork, the regulations, the local ordinances, all Correct. that sort of thing. Correct. And that's what you're about charging by the hour. Yes. Right? That's right. Okay. Um, and so, uh, what do you estimate? How much effort do you estimate you require uh, to come up with an adequate selection of, of properties? How much time do you feel that typically would take? Although I understand that there's a lot of details here, so maybe you know. Well, it depends on the, how many locations we're looking at. I'd say from the ones that we have researched in the past, probably uh, ten, eight to ten hours per prefecture. So we need to find who the right um, uh, agencies are to speak to, receive data from them. Sometimes they don't have all of it. We have to go to another. Like for example, when we did Nagano, we had to. First speak to the Tourism Bureau, we got a bit of info from them, they then sent us to the Fire and Safety Department, and then they sent us to, um, to a local, I think it was City Hall Business Registration Department. So we had to collate information from a few different sources and obviously um, translate it and pack it up for you guys in English and just give you the bottom line. So I'd say between 8 to 10 hours uh, per prefecture that we're looking at. Okay. Um, but I'll, I, I might start with what we've already got. We don't need to charge you for that. So I'll send you what I've got. I just can't remember if it's Nagano or Niigata. I'm sorry. Um, so we've got the information for one of those areas. I'll send that to you. And if you're satisfied with that, we can just start looking in that area. We don't need to go beyond that. Okay, okay. that's fair. Yeah. I, I have a list of Naganos I like to... <laughs> Oh my god, I'm terrible. I have a lot. Yeah. And I'm like, to make it just five. <laughs> Uh, you're not looking for real snow start. areas, right? You're not looking for anything like uh, Hokkaido or the further north of Niigata or so forth? Because I was thinking about the... He doesn't want to be too close to the Fukushima. Yep. Although Hokkaido is so awesome, but it's in a tiny island. Well, it is an island, and um, well, it's about nine hours from uh, Fukushima, though nine ten hours oh. by train. Yeah, it's not too far. And, and actually, that's fine. Yeah, it might be alright. But do you, do you like snowy areas, or were you thinking more of a temperate zone? Uh, that's a good question. As long as it's high elevation, I just like. Yeah, I, I just like high elevation. Yeah, I think I think what we want to do is try to focus on mountain regions. I don't know, Hokkaido is it. Is it Hokkaido high elevation? And um, there's a lot of elevation in Hokkaido, but the thing is, there um, tourism is pretty seasonal. So if it's not winter, I'm not sure how much tourism you'll get there. And the other thing is that maintenance costs are higher in the snow area. Okay, all right. Less people too. Um, yeah. But I mean, look, during the winter, it's booming. So if you're looking to cater specifically to winter tourism, I'd go there. Otherwise, maybe go a little bit south. Yeah, I don't think I want to just care for winter. For me, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think I'll pass on Hokkaido. Yeah, I think maybe Nagano, Niigata, uh, Gifu Prefecture might be as far Gifu north as I would go. Nagano. Yeah. Uh, Yamanachi. Yep. I love those. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Anything Tokyo, warmer? Tokyo, Tokyo. Sorry, go ahead. Hello. Like little village or town near Tokyo. Uh, I mentioned one. I forgot the name now. Uh, what's the one that we watched? Saitama Prefecture, maybe? Be I don't remember. Okay. But it, well, basically, she wants to be near a farming community. I do. I do want to have a place where we get uh, Some kind a of nice garden situation. and farm. Farming too. If, if there is extra uh, garden, 
ideal. Well, anywhere in the countryside would have a farm nearby. I think the uh, onsen and temple requirement is a bit more uh, limiting than the farm. Farms will be... <laughs> <laughs> I would agree. I would agree. Yeah. Okay, temple, you can cross that. I think, I think well, I mean, if, if we get lucky, why not? <laughs> I think my main concern is, is tourist uh, transportation to and from oh, yes. the location. Yes. It needs to be relatively uncomplicated, I think, we would want be it to something, be a factor that we might want to consider with the location. Um, close to the station. You know, can a tourist get from an airport to there? Well, close to the station is not going to be a remote sort of resort, though. I think... Uh, what no, 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 but like, like if they could take, like, go to a station and then take a bus in and then maybe a taxi at the end, yeah. if that's even possible. It's or if they possible, get but it's, TV, it's not simple. <laughs> What's that? It's possible, but it doesn't sound that simple. What most resorts do oh. is um, they pick you up from the nearest station. So they'd have a, like a little pickup truck on the resort. And yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, we consider that as a possibility. Yeah, that's fine we're open too. to that yeah. as well. Yeah. That will be the easiest. I mean, there are people that would go out of their way and take an extra bus and an extra local train, but a lot of them will just look for more convenient places. So it might be something to just just factor that into the business plan. You might want to have a pickup truck there and somebody who can drive it and pick pick them up from the nearest station. Yeah, yeah. So so it may be it may be that. So we're kind of it's hard to know for us because we don't know Japan that well. So well, well, I don't know where it would be. Yeah. Uh, they do pick us up and yeah, well, far. A lot of resorts do. We're going to be doing that. Uh, the areas, the, the countryside areas are pretty similar in that there's usually going to be a station, a train station, say up to 30, 40 minutes from the mountainside resorts. And then there's either a local train that goes there like once or twice a day kind of thing or a bus that goes maybe a few more times a day. Um, so again, some people are okay with that. Some people just get picked up by resort operators. So it depends on location, but they're all pretty similar in that. I think I might, um, I'll send you um, an audio recording that we did um, an analyzing a similar project for another customer where we've looked into... Um, We've looked into a particular area that was in Nagano, I think. We looked into a particular area for them and just tried to factor how people will get to the resort, what the local competition is like, and that sort of thing. Um, it just might help you to just to listen to the things that we normally look at for these kinds of projects. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so I think I've got a rough idea of what I think what we'll do from here on is I'll send you what we've got on the one prefecture that we did research. And I'll send you those recordings so that you know maybe a few other, maybe just a few other things that you know you don't don't know that you want to think about just yet. Yeah. And I then. Know that Nagano and Gifu has hot springs, right? That's why I kind of eye you on them. There's a lot of places with hot springs. Um, yeah. Depends on yeah. the temperature. I mean, it, down where we are in Kyushu, there's very nice mountainous areas and very nice hot springs, but. The temperatures tend to be slightly higher than they are in the places that you're looking at. So it's a matter of preference. And it's also a matter of which, which countries the guests you're going to be catering to will come to. Um, so Westerners tend to drift towards Osaka and Tokyo and then branch from there. Um, people from Southeast Asia like Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, they tend to come in through Fukuoka, through the Southwestern Airport. Um, so if your clientele is going to be mainly American and European, you might want to consider the places that you've mentioned. Um, but otherwise, there are other, other interesting locations as well. Okay. He actually told me that he kind of wants it to be a warmer climate. Well, you've mentioned Bali. That's why I was thinking maybe you do prefer these kinds of areas. Uh, well, no. I, well, no. We were just talking about it. Oh, okay. I think I would prefer to, to have the operation in, you know, in, the, in the altitude. Cool, cool. Yeah, cool I mean, pilot. hot places to vacation is great and everything, but it's nice to be able to go from a hot area to a temperate area where it's kind of nice. Like well, if you're, if you're up on a mountain in Japan, it's not going to be hot. I wouldn't worry about that. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just a matter of whether it snows there in the winter or not. That's all. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. some may, some may not. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, you know, I being in a tropical climate all the time isn't necessarily required, but we'd be open to looking at what's available. But I think it would be nice to be able to travel a short distance to get to a lower altitude for that sort of thing and then go back to the resort very, you know, for day trips and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, that would be cool as a thing, but not a requirement. So like a reasonable sized city up to maybe two hours away kind of thing. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Cool. like uh, fun day tripping. Yeah, right? yeah. And but but then also knowing that you can go back to this place that's not near anything and it'll be really quiet at night. You know. Yeah. That okay. kind of situation. Okay. So I'll send you what we've got so far, and I'll send you those recordings to listen to, and then maybe just um. Let me know if you want to start digging into that particular area or if you want us to look at other prefectures and then we'll take it from there. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Thanks. Take care. So there you go. Domestic tourism slowly picking up. International tourism hopefully not too far behind. So these resort ideas are gaining traction again. And to be perfectly honest, these old homes in the Japanese countryside are sold very, very cheaply. And they're only likely to get cheaper considering the population decline in those areas. So for those among you who enjoy a Japanese Inaka countryside holiday uh, once or twice a year, you could do a lot worse than buying one of these for your own personal use, even without the added aspect of potentially turning it into an accommodation business in the future. So drop us a line if you need a hand researching or contacting agents, etc. We're always happy to help. So I do hope you've enjoyed this episode. Let us know what you think in the comments section of wherever you might have found it. And even better, we would really love it if you could rate us or even better, leave us a review in the iTunes store. We love hearing from you. And the more reviews and ratings that we get, the easier it becomes for people who benefit from our content to find us. So it's really a public service you're doing by rating us. Take a few seconds, give us your rating, hugely appreciated. That's it from us for today, folks. Hope to have you with us again next time. And until then, from all of us here at NTI, hope you have a great day or night ahead. Yoshiku.